speaker is Tim Johnson. Tim is a longtime birder and an avid fisherman who has served Salem Audubon Society in many capacities, as well as being our current president and past field trip leader. He compiles the Salem Christmas bird count and is the leading technician for Birders Night, which of course is his most important role as far as we're concerned. Tim is going to introduce us to Cozumel, a Caribbean paradise. Take us there, Tim. In, in 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, 10 minutes. Oh, bear, bear with me. Uh, so Carol and I uh, visited Cozumel in uh, early, well, last winter. We were there from February 27th to March the 6th. And fortunately, we were able to get back into the country before the coronavirus situation blew up. Uh, there was a question of whether we were going to get through customs, honestly, but we got back and we're lucky for that. Uh, later tonight's program, you're going to hear about another island in the Caribbean Sea from Kathy Patterson talking about uh, Jamaica. So Cozumel is located on the Caribbean Sea. Uh, it's Cozumel uh, Coral Reef is part of the Meso Mesoamerican um, Reef, uh, Coral Reef, which constitutes about half of the Caribbean Sea uh, along the Yucatan Peninsula, down along the coast of Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and then out into the middle of the uh, sea. It's the second largest barrier reef in the world uh, and host to innumerable plants and animals, mostly fish, that are just gorgeous uh, as tropical birds would, uh, tropical fish and plants would be, as you can imagine, and the waters are crystal clear. And that's really what drew Carol and me to go to Cozumel because of its uh, proximity to the United States, honestly. And uh, it's one of the closest uh, places you can go and see the Caribbean uh, to the US. So Cozumel is an island off of uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, uh, not far from Cancun right across the straits from Playa del um, Tel Car Car Carmel. There are ferries between the island and the mainland, but we chose to fly directly to Cozumel from Texas. And we rented a car at the airport in Cozumel. So here's an aerial view of Cozumel. You can see how little development there is on the island. Most of the development is along the west coast. Uh, of the island that faces the Yucatan Peninsula. This side of the island is protected from the trade winds and the associated swells. So this is where most of the people explore the barrier reef from. Carol and I rented an apartment about 10 miles south of San Miguel, which is the major population of, of the island where all the, uh, where all the cruise ships come into. There's about seven of them that come in there every day. That's their major uh, source of revenue for the island is, is tourism in those cruise ships. And so we were south of that uh, near Playa Uvas. Uh, and to the right, you can see a, a, a view of the, of the water from, from our front deck. And this is a panoramic view. And what you're seeing there is, is that coral reef that uh, surrounds the island. The nice thing about being on the west side is if you're going to go out and spend some time in the water, it's best not to have winds and wave uh, to, to deal with. And so that's why most people are over here on this side of the island. Uh, there are public um, access points to the water and to the reef. Uh, there's also a number of um, public resorts um, that um, you can visit with. Most of them don't have a fee to um, use their prop property. Uh, you can actually 
camp out there for the day. Uh, if you get there early, you can get a nice prime spot right on the waterfront. And then there are people to bring you local cuisine and, and beverages all day. Um, but the nicest thing about it is you've got really nice access to the water and to the reef. Um, some of the resorts have actual piers that you can uh, take out and then ladders that take you down to the outside of the reef. Uh, and here you can see Carol out there uh, on the right um, snorkeling around and exploring the reef. The fish are just thick in there and there's a lot of them and, and really good uh, variety, beautiful fish. And the water is just, you can see how clear it is. It's like, it's just like a fish tank. It's so beautiful. Um, this gives you an idea what you would be, what you would have to contend, contend with if you didn't have easy access to, to the water. Otherwise, you'd be climbing over this, these rocks and slippery coral reefs to try to get into that water. So most of the time we spent uh, in these public uh, restaurants, resorts, uh, to, get access to, the, um, to get access to the water. And the water is alive with these fish. Um, they come right up to you. You're not supposed to feed them. We didn't, of course, but they're interested. So they'll come right up to you. Now, I didn't have a very good camera. I just had my iPhone in a plastic, in a plastic pouch, and I'm trying to take pictures, and it's almost impossible to focus. You can't focus. I really need to get a better camera, but you can see that it's really hard to get a good, good shot of these, of these fish. Uh, they're just gorgeous. So this fish is is this, this parrot fish and gives you, a, this is a professional photographer took this one, not me. So um, um, I'm going to explore when we go there next time, a better way to take photos that you can focus, that you can actually focus. It's, it's one thing to have your camera protected. It's another to be able to actually focus on what you're trying to take a picture of. So even though Cozumel is 10 miles from the mainland, it does have a variety of species that can only be found on the island, including three bird species. I was able to find one of these birds, uh, but the rest I'll have to go back for. Uh, there's also some birds that are uh, endemic to the Yucatan Peninsula, including Cozumel, and this is one of them, the Yucatan uh, woodpecker. Uh, sorry, this is not in very good focus. Uh, this is not an endemic bird, but uh, was a new bird for me, a tropical mockingbird, and we got really nice looks at it. Uh, it's a beautiful bird. This this uh, western spindalis uh, can be found around the Caribbean. I'm sure you'll see this in some of Kathy's slides as well. There are some um, inland um, freshwater uh, wetlands on Cozumel that are accessible and you can find birds like this northern Hakana and a number of other um, wetland, um, um, freshwater um, wetland birds like these uh, American flamingos and terns. I was not able to find the endemic uh, Cozumel emerald hummingbird. Uh, I did find this gray-breasted mango. One of my favorite birds was this banana quit. And we got quite a few looks at this bird, uh, both up in the trees and, and it will hang, hang out on those uh, rocks down by the water. So that was a fun bird to watch. Some of the other animals you can see uh, commonly in Cozumel is this black spiny tailed iguana. It's a pretty big animal, uh, intimidating. <laughs> and a few other endemic animals that you can find on Cozumel, the coati, 
this harvest mouse, uh, raccoon, and toadfish. I, I did not see these animals. Um, even with nine days, with there's just so much of Cozumel, we were not able to um, visit uh, for our next time. So we had great fun uh, snorkeling every day, a couple times a day, enjoying the local food, which was phenomenal, and drinking out of co drinking um, coconut milk out of coconuts, <laughs> and enjoying the natural beauty of Cozumel. Any questions? We did not hire a guide. We just went on our own. We didn't get a tour company. We just did it on our own. You can get all these this stuff off of the website. We we hired the, we got the 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 apartment we rented off B and B. You know it's pretty easy, but you do need to do some research before you go down there. You're going to need some vaccinations. Uh, you need to do some research and study before you go there to really enjoy it, uh, including where you're going to stay and and the transportation, how you're going to get there, renting cars, getting the insurance. Let me know if you have any questions about that. Tim, how was the weather while you were there? Oh, it's beautiful. So we chose late February because that's when the temperature is the lowest and the rainfall is the least and the weather is less severe. So it's kind of the sweet spot. The rest of the year you get there in summer and the heat can be so stifling it's hard to be outside. And then there's the rainy, then there's the monsoons that uh, you want to avoid. Okay, I think that winds it up. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Cynthia Donald. Cynthia is relatively new to Salem Audubon and to Salem. But she is very active, serving on the boards of Salem Audubon and of the Friends of the Willamette Valley Complex. She also leads the Salem Audubon Field Trip Committee. Cynthia is an avid world traveler, and today she will take us on a whirlwind tour exploring the eight continents. Hi, everyone. Can you guys see my screen? We see you. I see you. Sorry? No, we do not see your screen yet. Oh, you're kidding. Well, um, let me redo. I hit share screen. Sorry, guys. There's a little the share button in the lower right I, corner. I know. Oh, I have to hit that one, too. Yeah. That's what the problem is. There you go. Okay. Okay, here we go. Can you see it now? Yes, indeed. All righty. Well, this is going to be a whirlwind uh, tour through what I'm calling the eight continents. Um, you all know what the first seven are, so let's start with those. First up is Africa. Now, these photos are just some of the many different types of animals that you can see. I have birds, I have mammals, I have reptiles, whatever. Uh, anyway, some of the... Um, Iconic birds are in Africa you can find are bustards, babblers, bee eaters, of course the roller family is well represented there. The storks are incredible and the weavers are just absolutely stunning. Some of the animals you can see would be cheetah, of course the mountain gorilla, and I put this adorable little cape fox, this is a young kit. Uh, they were right outside, there was a family right outside the veranda where my daughter and I were staying up in the um, um, uh, northwestern part of um, South Africa. I was in the Kalahari, as were the cheetah family. Those are three teenage cheetahs uh, who the mother left under the cicacia tree as she was finishing her hunt. And as we were losing our light and leaving um, this one young cheetah turned to look at us. And I thought, well, that's gonna make an interesting photo. 
Now we go on to Antarctica. Of course, I don't think you can think about Antarctica without thinking about the penguins. There's so many different penguins there. Uh, the Adelis were my favorite just because they are so, um, they're just, they're just cute little penguins, I guess is all I can say about them. Gen 2s are everywhere. And the king penguin down at the bottom, that is a breeding colony of several hundred thousand penguins. And of course, uh, Antarctica is also well represented by uh, the Antarctic tern. Some of the other birds that are pretty iconic down there, like mantled albatross, the Southern Wandering Albatross, and then the Snow Petrel, which um, as far as I know, is the only bird that actually breeds on the ant, well, other than the penguins, um, that breeds on the, um, on the continent itself. Some of the mammals that are there, um, I chose four different seals, the Southern Elephant Seal, the Leopard Seal, which is one of the top predators there, uh, crab eater seal, which is, I discovered when I was down there, it is the most numerous seal uh, on the planet. And I'd never heard of crab eater seals, but they were certainly everywhere. And then the Weddell seal, which is a very large, beautiful, um, this one is kind of just laying out on the ice, but they are really, really gorgeous when they're in the water. Now let's moving on to Asia. Asia has a whole incredible variety of different types of mammals that are in the ape, the, uh, ape family. Uh, Golden Langer, that photo was taken in Bhutan. Uh, snow monkey, those guys are um, very polite. And this photo was taken up on the very Northern island of Hokkaido um, in Japan. And then the orangutan, the mom and the kid and the old man those were taken um, in Malaysia on uh, the Malaysian portion of the island of Borneo. Some of the birds that you can find in Asia include um, a whole bunch of different uh, interesting birds called spider hunters, these long, long decurved bills. Of course, you have uh, the pheasants, the crested fireback in the upper right and the great Argus in the uh, lower left. Um, and then there's some funny birds. Well, funny, this guy looks like a comical uh, cartoon bird, the short-tailed green magpie. It's just outrageous, all the different colors that are on that guy. Um, some of the others, of course, the hornbill family is very, very well represented um, in a number of Asian countries, as are the kingfishers. The laughing thrush is certainly uh, also well represented everywhere and they are very, very beautiful uh, birds that live in, um, live in large groups. And then this tiny little white fronted falconet up in the upper left, just a tiny, tiny little bird. Uh, we found this family roosting on this little um, snag. Here we are at the last of the eight continents, which is Australia. You can't think about Australia, I don't think, without thinking about bowerbirds and fairy wrens, which are all over the country. And I included a photo of uh, a bower on the right of a satin bowerbird. This is a, a blue uh, it's much drabber than the regent, but the bower is incredible. And each uh, bower bird has a whole, uh, the males build the, the bowers, and each one has a whole different strategy. Uh, bowers are all kind of different shapes. This one you can see has bits of grass that are uh, constructed and held together and make a little arch with an opening in there. And then they will decorate it, the males will decorate it. And each male, each species of male, Bowerbird has their own uh, particular um, assortment of things that they decorate with. This one, uh, the satin bowerbird, chooses blue. So there's bits of blue straw there, there's blue bottle caps there, there's pieces of blue foil that were also uh, in this bower. It was pretty interesting. Another um, amazing family that's well represented in Australia 
are the parrots. Uh, this is the red-tailed black cockatoo up in the upper um, left. Um, and kookaburras. You always think of, I always think of kookaburras as being um, in Australia. And I didn't really uh, appreciate the fact that they're part of the kingfisher family. Um, they're not a water obligate though, kingfisher. They actually live, as you can see from the photo, in um, some of the uh, more forested areas and they hunt in the fields. And then the powerful owl. This owl was in a public park that was um, on the way to where my daughter and I were walking to go to the Sydney Opera House. And so we decided we were gonna find this guy and there it was. This is the largest owl in Australia and it is a really big owl. Here's some of the animals that you can encounter in Australia. The koala, of course, it's iconic. It's also the symbol on the Qantas um, airplanes. But instead of doing uh, lar the large uh, kangaroo uh, animals, I liked, I really fell in love with the, uh, the little wallaby uh, group that we saw. This one has a little joey, I think you can see maybe um, in, her in her pouch. And then the redneck patty melon. Patty melons are tiny. They're about the size uh, of a house cat. Some of them are even smaller. They're tiny, tiny little marsupials that hop around. This one um, I encountered on an early morning walk um, outside of our lodge. Now we're moving on to Europe. And I took uh, liberties with this because this is, um, this is not on continental Europe, but it's on a part of Europe that is uh, owned by Norway called uh, Svalbard. And I have a photo of uh, Brunich's Guillemot. We call this a, a thick-billed mirror. And on these cliffs, these birds don't build a nest. They just find a place in the cliff and that's where they set up housekeeping. Um, the, cliff face that we were on and looking at had over 200,000 pair of breeding Brunich's guillemot. You can see a close up of a pair of those birds on the right. And then on this trip, there were a group of divers. Um, I used to do a lot of um, scuba diving and these guys were taking underwater photos. So if you've ever been curious as to what a Brunich's guillemot looks like when it's underwater and diving, just look down at the lower right and you'll see one. Now we're in France, we're in the Pyrenees Mountains and that's where you can find wall creeper, which is a, just an exquisitely beautiful bird. And also field fare, which is very, very common. It's one of the uh, most common thrushes in Europe. And then the other two birds, the little auk and the ivory gull, were way back up on uh, very far north Norway again. Some of the animals, um, we encountered many, many walrus up there. And also polar bear. This young male actually swam up to the stern of the boat. And I know he was trying to figure out how to get into that can of sardines because he knew there was food on the ship but he just wasn't quite sure how to get it open. Next up, North America. That was a hard one. So I started with Alaska with willow ptarmigan and then went over to um, uh, Maine for the Atlantic puffin and also for the razorbill. Both of, both of those were taken on Machaya Seal Island. Okay, Painted Red Start and Greater Roadrunner. They're two of my birds from, um, from Arizona where I lived for over 40 years. And Ferruginous Pygmy Owl and the Groove Build Ani, those were photos I took down in Mexico. Here's some of the animals. Coatimundi, that's from the um, Southwestern United States. Sea Otter, we're back up in Alaska. American Bison, we're in uh, Yellowstone in winter. And the monarch butterflies were up in um, one of the monarch uh, reserves that is in the state of Michoacan, uh, Mexico, which is quite a spectacle to see those. Seventh continent is South America. 
How can you think about South America without thinking about clay licks? This group of red and green macaws was on their clay lick. Uh, this was taken in Peru. Black cap donacobius, that's uh, also taken in Peru. Plate billed mountain toucan, the toucans are very well represented in South America as are barbets, as are hummingbirds. And I've got a photo of a violet saber wing in there. Here's some of the animals. Tamandua is, a, um, is an interesting anteater. This was taken um, in southern Panama. They have uh, a prehensile tail, which is they're very, very interesting. Uh, the glass frog, it has a, a translucent skin, hence the name, and the giant otter. That was, um, that is quite, they live in, uh, these otters live in big family groups. And this one was following our boat. Now for number eight. Here's a hint. These animals are only found there. Madagascar. Aha, you cheated. <laughs> no, I know. As them. are these animals, leaf-tailed gecko, spiny back chameleon, and day gecko. And the day gecko was taken at, that photo was taken at breakfast. It was on the side of our thing. Um, and some of the endemic birds, the kuas are endemic, the mesites are endemic, the vangas, there's a huge number of vangas and they are just amazing. And the long-tailed ground roller. Madagascar blue pigeon, Madagascar wood rail, Madagascar kukal, and the Madagascar pygmy kingfisher can also be found there, as can these two birds. So we started with Africa, and we'll end with a sunset shot over the Zambezi River in Africa. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Judy, you need to unmute. Judy, we cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Cynthia, Tim says, beautiful photos. What camera are you using these days for taking bird photos? Um, I am not a photographer. Um, I have a what's called a bridge camera. I actually have uh, the second one. Uh, most of the photos that I showed were taken with my first bridge camera I ever had, uh, which was a... Um, um, a Panasonic that had a Leica lens. And this one I have now, I like better. Uh, well, it, it does more things. And uh, it is a uh, Canon. Very good. How long have you been able to spend on your favorite continents? This was a question, I believe, from Eugenia. Um, well, the longest trip I ever took was a five week long trip that a friend and I did and we were in Asia, but we were only in uh, Thailand and uh, Cambodia. Very good. Let's see. Oh, uh, the Canon, it's a Canon power shot. Um, I'd have to go get it to tell you what it all is. But um, if you're interested, um, send me an email and I'll tell you what right. it is. <laughs> Teresa Byrne did ask what model of camera. Yeah, I, I just saw that come up in the chat. Right. Thank you so much, Cynthia. It was well, very, thank you guys. very fun to go around the whole world with you. And yeah, in less than 15 minutes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Saves a lot of airfare. <laughs> oh, yes, it does. <laughs> okay, our next Speaker is Harry Fuller. No, and no, Eugenia, Kathy. Eugenia, Kathy, me. Uh, yeah, we're supposed oh. to be doing Jamaica. Whoa, 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 sorry. That's Thank why I wasn't Kathy. quite ready. I was waiting for Jamaica. Aha. Uh Aha. -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. That spills the beans on, on me. Um, I was going to first introduce Kathy before revealing what she's talking about. Kathy Patterson. Um, Long, another long time Salem Audubon member. She's been on the board twice. She's 
taught the in the elementary school program that Audubon runs, and she served for 10 years on the Birders' Night Committee. When Kathy retired from the Salem Public Schools as a reading specialist, she wanted to bird the world, and she has very much succeeded in doing so. Tonight, we're going to see pictures of one of her many, many uh, birding spots, Jamaica, exotic birding on a Caribbean island. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Eugenia. Notice that we did this March 1st through 7th of 2000, you know, 2020. And again, like Tim mentioned, this was before uh, the big shutdown. We barely got back when, when you know, everything was closed. So um, although I'm presenting, all the bird photos are by Eric Hines. Um, he's a field guides leader. And this is the, the, the fourth trip we've taken with him. And he did, he did all the photos and graciously uh, let me borrow them. Next. So again, Tim is helping me out by, um, I sent him this as a PowerPoint and then he's, he's um, doing the next. So Jamaica, why you'd want to go there if you're a birder? It has 27 endemic species. I mean, that on a small island, um, Jamaica is the third largest in the Caribbean. And I was glad that Tim showed where Jamaica was on his map. It's the largest English speaking island in the Caribbean. So um, because it was um, English for so long, um, you know, you can communicate with the locals. 146 miles long, 51 miles wide, multiracial population, and it has a tropical climate. Next. We were there in March, so the climate was perfect. Um, it had rained a lot, and so many of the trails were muddy, uh, but we had nice weather generally during the daytime. This is our group, and what Field Guides does that I really like it, um, is that it's small groups. There are only um, seven of us, and so we fit comfortably in a nice um, air-conditioned, um, you know, a small bus. Um, this is our um, Jamaican guide, um, Dwayne uh, Swabi, and um, you know he, you know, he was a big help to us. Next, so we stayed. The beauty of, um, and I think that first slide showed that I should have mention that more, but we flew into Montego Bay and it's best to avoid Kingston, which is the capital of Jamaica, um, just because it's got a higher crime rate than say um, the Northern coast. All these big um, resorts are located pretty much on the Northern coast. So flew into Montego Bay, um, took like the, the van to Greencastle State. The beauty of this is we stayed the entire week in this lovely resort. Um, next. Next slide, thank you. And so in the evenings after our birding, um, we would sit on this balcony overlooking the hills um, and that lovely swimming pool um, with drinks with our birding lists. I mean, talk about a relaxing way to spend the evening. Um, I didn't even stick my foot in that pool, however, the whole week because you're so, you're so busy birding. And you're so tired when you finish that um, it's a beautiful scene, um, but I didn't get to enjoy it. Next. So why it was so lovely to stay in this place, the Green Castle Estate, is they have extensive grounds and many, many roads and trails throughout, or like dirt roads throughout, uh, throughout their property. And we could see half of the endemic birds of Jamaica just from the Green Mountain Estate a green castle estate. Um, so you can see all the flowers and that really attracts hummingbirds. Next. I wanted to start with probably my favorite birds um, because at the end of the trip, Eric Hines always asks us, well, what are your top three or four favorite birds of the trip? Well, this is one of them. The red-billed streamer tail um, is, is really locally known as the doctor and part of the reason, first of all, it's a huge hummingbird. It's eight to 10 inches long with those streamer tails. Um, and then um, the males 
when they're flying, um, because of the long streamers, they make kind of a humming sound. So, um, you know, it's just a remarkable bird to see. Next. Um, Eric Sharp Eyes spotted this female um, streamer tail hummingbird on a nest. And my gosh, how he got this picture because, I mean, even with, you know, binoculars trying to look through that little little space between the leaves and he got a very fine picture of the female on the nest. Next. Well, another of my favorite birds was the Jamaican toady. Um, all the main isle, islands of the Caribbean, um, for instance, like Cuba and um, oh, uh, Haiti, the Dominican, Dominican Republic, they all have their own toadies. Um, they look very similar, uh, but they're considered an endemic bird um, to their individual islands. Um, they are so cute. They're only three to five inches long. Um, um, just a remarkable bird to see. Next. Um, because the grounds um, almost had you know, lawn areas, um, we saw um, this uh, also endemic bird, the white chin thrush. Um, it's very common and widespread and think, think American robins when you're looking at this bird. Um, it does have an interesting habit of cocking its tail upward unlike our robins. Next. Well, um, after we spent um, a day birding the grounds of the Greencastle estate, then off we go um, to the mountains. Um, and as you can see, um, the mountains are covered with coffee plantations. And unfortunately, most of the coffee in Jamaica is not shade grown. It's growing in on these hillsides, but the rainforest has been cut. Um, luckily, there's still preserves in the Jim Crow and the Blue Mountains. It's a long day drive to get there um, because we always went back to the Green Castle Estate at night. At night. Next. So the birds we just really, really um, were seeking were two very hard to find ones. Um, the first one is the Jamaican lizard cuckoo that you're seeing in this photo. Um, you're going to see another cuckoo, but this one has a red eye that you probably can't see and a straight bill. And then the next slide has the chestnut bellied cuckoo. Um, the lizard cuckoo is only about 15 inches. Um, this one's 19 to 22 inches. I mean, this is almost two feet. So you can imagine how large it is, but cuckoos, just like our yellow-billed cuckoo in North America, it's oftentimes very secretive. Um, so this is different because it has a dark eye and a curved bill. Next. So one of the highlights of this trip uh, was trying to find a, cre a crested quail dove now, other countries in um, oh, Central America and South America have quail doves, but unlike just our doves, um, quail doves are very secretive. They're always hard to find forest birds. Well, as you can see, I am perched up on a wall, <laughs> trying to look through all this foliage. Um, this is Linda Reynolds, and she was you know, great to have on the trip and even shared some photos to me after the trip. But you can see she's holding the scope. And what I did not notice until I looked at this picture more carefully, that extra hand behind me is our guide, Eric Hines, <laughs> right there in case I fell off the wall. <laughs> but um, again, very hard to find bird. And next. And this is what it looks like. It is an absolutely stunning bird. Now, Eric heard it because it makes um, kind of a kind of a, a mournful um, two to three syllable cry. Um, and so he knew it was there and it was just a matter of trying to find it. Um, they're rare and very local. So we felt very lucky to find this bird. Next. This is just another um, photo of the uh, crested quail dove. 
Next. So on these long two day drives when we went to different parts of the island, um, we would stop at this Boston jerk um, cafe, um, open air of course, and they had you know choices. You either could have um, um, beef, um, chicken or pork, um, kind of sandwiches like, and next. But, but uh, Eric showed off what, what <laughs> it could look like <laughs> looking at a pork one to, um, at the jerk stop. Next. The other thing that was always served with um, whatever you ordered um, was this, and it was called Festival, which is like a deep fried uh, zucchini or veggies, um, but always accompanied the meal. Next. Well, here's a Jamaican Oreo. They're about eight inches, so smaller than a robin. Um, Orioles, of course, you know, are so you know, beautifully colored. Um, this one has that bright yellow uh, to dull greenish um, yellow with a black mask. Um, it's got a very, very large white wing patch. Next. They're also very acrobatic. Um, we saw this one, you know, hanging upside down. Um, just like Orioles, they can be fruit eaters, but also insect eaters. Next. So we headed to the Blue Mountains and sure enough, we did find this blue mountain vireo. They're only about five inches. Um, they're very uncommon um, and hard to find. And we felt we were lucky to even see this one. Um, and they have a red eye, which would be hard to see in this photo, but they like those mo moist uh, mountain forests. Next. Um, we saw um, the Jamaican Bacard. And like all the cards, and there's several, several species in Central and South America, and always the male is like, you know, almost black, very dark. Um, it, it behaves like other flycatchers where um, it might sit on a branch and then it's waiting for an insect prey and will dash out and fly catch it and then go back to its same perch or another one nearby. Next. So the females, um, Jamaican Bacard, looks radically different. Um, Bacard females are usually shades of brown or reddish. Now this one we were very lucky to see because, next slide, it was flying to its nest. So this Bacard nest looks a lot like Oriole. Uh, think of um, Bullock, like think of Bullock's Oriole. Um, they're long, um, quite large hanging nests. And then she was heading right straight for it. Next. The rufous tail flycatcher, again, these are all endemics. Uh, it's in the genus Myarchus. So think um, ash, um, ash throated flycatcher that we have that you might see at Malheur or Page Springs. Um, it has a bright, rusty tail. Now it's even showing brighter in this slide because of the light behind it. Um, it likes the moist um, forest. Next. The sad flycatcher, though, is in the same Myorcus genus, um, but it looks quite different. It doesn't have that bright rusty tail, but the same, a same genus. Next. And this is the Jamaican Elania. And again, Central and South America have many species of Elania. They're usually small, like this is only five inches. Um, and it has no wing bars, but like that uh, whitish stripe above the eye. Uh, next. Um, the only endemic um, warbler species in Jamaica is the arrowhead warbler. And this looks so much like a black and white warbler that we might have in North America, but behaves very differently instead of uh, you know, walking more or less up and down the branches like a, um, like a, our, our, a black and white warbler. This one's very secretive and it's high in, high, high in the canopy of a rainforest. Um, we did see lots of other North American warblers um, that would be just wintering in Jamaica, but this is the only 
one that's endemic. Next. Now, Tim mentioned this. Um, he saw the Western Spindalis. Well, these islands like Cuba, they have their own Spindalis. There's eight different species of Spindalis, Spindalis that are just um, on the particular island, like Dominican Republic has one, Puerto Rico has one, and this is the Jamaican Spindalis. Um, they used to be called the stripe headed tanager, so you could be finding this book in a uh, bird in an older field guide um, with that name. Next, I found them absolutely gorgeous birds, and they usually, they didn't flit around so much like warblers and some of the harder to find ones, and would often sit out on a branch like this one. And notice that orangey stroke that it, uh, an upper breast that it has. Next. Ah, you know, we had a break. What the, the um, kill guides did a very nice job of organizing the trip because after we had those long drives over to the Blue Mountains or the uh, Jim Crow Mountains, uh, then this day, it was like Thursday during that week, um, our guide, Dwayne, uh, took us to a coastal point. And you can see how beautiful the ocean is. That's the closest I really got to the ocean I might have <laughs> and still didn't fit, stick my feet in it. Next. But at the very end of the island here, um, we saw these gorgeous white-tailed tropic birds. Well, if you've been to Hawaii, in Hawaii, um, they nest there in the canyon. Um, and also the white-tailed uh, tropic birds can be found throughout the Caribbean. Um, these actually do nest on um, Jamaica between March and June. And there were, you know, you know, maybe 50, 60 of them flying around. So it was a beautiful sight and it gave us a little break from our forest birding. Next. So that afternoon we went looking for parrots because um, they weren't in the high mountains. And this is called the black bill parrot. Um, it's in the mid-level hills um, in small flocks. Next. And the other endemic parrot, parrot is the yellow bill parrot. Now, this was really neat because we're walking kind of on an uh, open um, trail in the mid forest. It wasn't the deep rainforest. And we looked down at a canyon below us and we heard all this squawking um, before we even saw these parrots. And they flew in probably a group of 50 or so and landed um, in trees, like their trees below us. Next. And this would be a close-up um, picture of them. Um, so you can see the yellow bill and they have a really bright white eye ring, um, very different from the black billed parrot. Next. On the next, the last day, um, again, this was Friday of this week, packing us so much. Um, we took a break. We went to the Rocklands Bird Sanctuary. And as you can see, it has a beautiful view of um, um, uh, Montego Bay below us, where we flew in. And at, at um, the Rockland's Bird Sanctuary, they have um, a wide deck and you can get right close to the trees there and see all the birds in the trees. But next, the highlight was each of us got to sit in chairs with this little feeder, um, and we'd be holding this small um, hummingbird feeder, and these gorgeous red-billed streamer tail hummingbirds, I was saying like they were eight to 10 inches long, would come and sit on our fingers um, when we'd be feeding them out of this, um, <laughs> out of this um, little bird, um, bird feeder. And you can see one of our, our uh, participants has a smile on his face. Next. Like I said, the grounds were very extensive. Um, so just, just on that deck, we could see this hummingbird, um, the Jamaican mango. Um, it's five inches. I mean, it's as, it's as large as um, some of these little vireos and things you'd see. So a very large hummingbird um, has iridescent feathers. Um, next. 
And because there were so many flowers uh, around this deck, you could just be on the deck and watch all these other birds um, come to either the feeders or in this case, um, these flowering plants. Finally, uh, next. My last slide is of this orange quip. And I'll tell you, um, we saw this numerous days on our trip because they're quite common in mid-level forests, um, not in the high rainforests. But I tell you, um, this is the first picture that I saw its orange throat. Um, and that's why how it got its name. And it, the other interesting thing about it, it's the only bird in its genus. So um, orange quip, quits are endemic to Jamaica and quite rare. Um, next slide, please. And in the forest, um, I never saw the orange throat. That was the first time we saw it several days because it hides in these thick um, leaves of, you know, canopy, uh, in the canopy. So I thought it was um, fitting that I ended the slide with probably the, one of the hardest birds for me to find. And so I said, make Jamaica your next birding destination. Thanks so much. Any questions? Kathy, were there a few birds you saw everywhere and every day and you got well acquainted with? No, not, not at all because although, you know, we had about half the endemic species that we could see at where we stayed, um, at the Greencastle Estate. When we went um, to the two days to the Blue Mountain and the Jim Crow Mountains, those were um, days that we could only find specific birds at those high mountainous elevations. So, I mean, no, we didn't see them uh, every day. The common birds, um, maybe like our white chin thrush, you could see those in town even. Um, but but not these forest birds. That one was Eugenia's question. And my question is, were the streamer tails, those red billed streamer tails endemic or are they, do they appear anywhere else? No, you know, I meant to, um, and I noticed that the first two slides, I did not put that the red billed streamer tail and the Jamaican toadies were endemic. The only birds I saw that uh, are focused on today's program, uh, the white-tailed tropic birds, which aren't endemic. Um, they're all endemic. And that's why it even had that name, the doctor. I mean, it's, it's Jamaica's national bird. Um, and, you know, it, I, I've never seen a hummingbird so large. I mean, it's huge. And it even makes a kind of a humming noise when the streamer tails are flying. Right. Those were all, in, were all of the birds you showed endemic? Yes, all of them. So it was all endemic to Jamaica, except for that white bird. Perfect bird that you can see in Hawaii. <laughs> yes, I saw that in Hawaii, in fact. Well, thank you so much. Very interesting. Maybe Jamaica will be a good destination. <laughs> Why I thought it was amazing is that it's relatively a small place, a um, small island to see all these endemics. And I would really, even though we had two long drives, I would really re recommend staying in one place like we did, the Greencastle Estate. You can unpack one time um, and you come back every evening for happy hour on a lovely deck. <laughs> so it's just, it just made the trip you know, much less intense than some burden trips. Right, true. Don't have to move every two days or one day. Which mm -hmm. is a good deal. Okay, thank you. All right, now we will move on to Harry Fuller. Uh, Harry Fuller spent his career managing TV and internet newsrooms in San Francisco and London. But fortunately for us, he retired to Oregon and he now lives in Salem. Uh, we have in our midst the author of several books of natural history. 
they yeah. including gray owl, great gray owls in California, and freeway birding, and others. And Harry has been leading bird trips and teaching bird classes since the 1990s. Now, you would have the good fortune when our pod trips or regular field trips recommenced, you can take trips right here with Harry Fuller. And if we're lucky, maybe to Malher this spring. Hey. Oh, I just talked to the wonderful. field station. They'll know by the end of January if they're going to try to do field trips this year. OK. So now we're having moved to the Caribbean and then around the world and back to the Caribbean, we're going to stay in Oregon. Right. And can, you see what, right can, you, can you see the PowerPoint now? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Did you have anything more to say, Eugenia? Oh, I thought you were starting, so I stopped. That's fine. Okay. Oh, now, let me give them the title. Okay. On the move, lighter than air. Yes. He's going to focus on action shots. Yes. And uh, I have to be uh, very honest up front. I think I took maybe one of these pictures. But I have the good luck of when I leave field trips, there's usually one or two people with really good cameras. And some of them are really good with the cameras. And so these pictures are people that have been are, are been donated to me by people who take pictures. Uh, this is from Albert Reichman, who lives just down the road in Albany, uh, and is always sending me great pictures from uh, Talking Waters. And he's been on at least, I think, three of my trips to Malher, and I've brought her together with him in other places. And this is one that he got of a female um, harrier, and it's wonderful because you can really see the shape of that face and those hollows for the ears in there so they they can hear. As most of us know, they hunt by ear often, that's why they're down low. And they hear things in the grass that they never see. They've got good eyesight, but they can hear stuff just like an owl. Uh, this is a uh, picture from a friend of mine who lives in Ashland, and he and his wife bird the Klamath Basin at least once a week. Uh, and this is one of their wintering uh, rough-legged hawks. And this is another picture taken by him. And here you can actually see why they're rough-legged. If you look at these pictures, um, if you if you look at pardon me was somebody asking something no i think i could hear judy saying so anyway you can really see why they're rough legged you can see all those feathers hanging off the legs so that they uh, don't freeze in the arctic fall and spring anyway that's why they're really rough legged hawks we all recognize this guy he's looking for a fish I always think they're one of the first signs of spring when they start coming back, usually sometime in March, an osprey. Uh, I know it's uh, mealtime, and it's mealtime for the kestrel. Here he is about to have a bowl. It's a male, the kestrel, I mean. Here's a couple of red tails, uh, youngsters. Uh, I don't know whether they're going to share this pintail, and I can't imagine that they actually killed it themselves, but maybe they did. Here are a couple of kites over in Grand Ronde. This is a lousy picture, so you can tell I took it myself. Uh, but they're probably here in the Willamette Valley, our most elusive resident raptor. Uh, but they are around if you know exactly where to look for them. Here's a Swainson hawk uh, making a lot of noise. This is another picture from the Klamath Basin. Now this is one of my favorite birding sites. This is along uh, Highway 305. It's about mile post 17 as you head south from Burns. And there's one little juniper, I think it may be 10 feet tall at the most, out in the middle of a barren field. And there's this huge nest in it. And the ferruginous hawks have been nesting in there now for over a decade. And this last spring, this was the four. They weren't quite ready to fly yet, but they're sitting up in their nest going, come on, mom, we're hungry, we're hungry. Four ferruginous hawks. There's a shot of uh, tundra swans taken off. If you listen closely, you can hear those wings beating and the feet slapping against the water. 
we all recognize these guys. These were uh, offshore uh, harlequins over near Cannon Beach. But uh, you can, if you really want to see a lot of harlequin, take yourself to Puget Sound, go to Port Townsend, and at the old paper mill there on the levee, sometimes you'll see three or four hundred of them. They come on shore, and, and the local uh, people feed them bread and crackers. Tame harlequin, hard to believe. Here's Mama Wood Duck with her little litter of six. This is a great shot. Just bringing his beak out of the water. Probably going to put his beak perpendicular to the water and swallow whatever he managed to scoop up. Here's a couple of grebes. I think this is actually a courtship thing. I think the male is handing that fish to the female. Uh, definitely not courtship on the right, although the uh, spectator, I think, was a female, but it was two male pie-billed grebes trying to drown one another at Klamath Lake. Here's a mama-eared grebe with her little uh, zebra-striped baby, also at Klamath Lake. Common murs off the coast over near Newport on one of the offshore rocks. But one guy hasn't quite managed to swallow that little fish yet. Coming at you, one of our great woodpeckers, white-headed up in the Cascades. Stellar's jays, I actually took this picture myself. It was a, there was a, a pygmy owl hiding in this box and they had spotted him. So they were determined to scare him to the point where he had to fly out and they could get him. He never did come out. He was at least half as smart as the jays. Actually, I think this one I actually took myself too, but I love it. I love capturing little birds in action. And this was a red-breasted nuthatch at our, at our bird bath, very thirsty last summer. This is a nice shot. You don't get to see the uh, ruby crown on the ruby crown kinglet very often, but there it is, bright and bold. Lazulite bunty, just taking a bath at a spring up in the Cascades. Here's a Nashville warbler was at the same spring, same time, about six feet away. Oh, and this guy. Uh, this is a pygmy owl giving you the stare. This is why you don't want to come back as a sparrow or a robin. That's, that's a determined face. And of course, as we know, the pygmy owl uh, is a daytime hunter like the burrowing owl. So you often hear him around in the daytime going. And that's a signal that if you're a junko, you better be hiding. Great gray owl, one of my favorites, of course. The one on the right, getting rid of the fur and the bones. And this is one of the all-time great stories. Um, this is Andy Huber, a professor out at Eastern Oregon University. He and his wife have a couple hundred acres up in the mountains. And they knew they had a great gray owl nest somewhere on the ranch. And one day he was out with a bunch of his botany students looking at plants and they saw a great horned owl fly by with the male in his talons. So they realized that the female was now widowed and it was a time of year where she probably had eggs. So they looked around, they found the nest and he and his neighbors eventually started live trapping rodents and giving them to the female. And here she is coming down to get a vole. Eventually the young, all four of them, fostered by this man and his, his neighbors, helped the female raise all four of them. And they became, as time went on, very tame. Uh, eventually, he even saw them taking baths and stuff. This is one of my all-time favorite. Actually, this is outside of state, actually. This is down at Chico at the Bird Festival. But they brought a turkey vulture in. And this turkey vulture was extremely tame, although I'm told by people who work at Wildlife Rescue that they're the toughest bird to deal with because the minute you come near them, they puke all over you. And then if you pick them up, then they vomit on you again, and then they crap on your shoes. So they're very hard to deal with. But this one had become acclimated. And this was his keeper, and he was trying to get her badge off while 30 people stood around and laughed. Cranes, I don't know what I can say about cranes, except they are flying elegants. Um, these are pictures uh, from the Central Valley, but we also have cranes doing exactly the same thing right now on Sobe Island. And for anybody who's not been to Sobe Island in the winter, I would say it's a must trip. Uh, Lots of waterfowl, but the best in the world is the northernmost wintering cranes on North American continent. 
And that's where we'll end because there's nothing more elegant in Oregon in the winter than a flock of cranes. Any questions? Don't ask me about the cameras. I don't know much about cameras. That was one of the questions. What kind of camera and lens is being used? Oh my God. Well, send me an email and I will get a hold of the two <laughs> important photographers. One is Kirk Gooding out of Ashland, the other is Albert Reichman out of Albany. Uh, and they'll be happy to tell you. What I use is a little Canon point and shoot, but they, they use real cameras with real lenses. And, and in fact, Albert even has a tripod that he uses occasionally on his. So. Um, I, you know, I can barely handle a tripod with a scope on it, but I certainly would never be able to do it with a camera. So I have a little camera that fits in my pocket. And it gets mediocre pictures that I can identify the birds from. But these guys are real photographers. And my I'll, be question, happy, I'll be happy to get the information for you. Just send me my question was about the uh, juniper tree on Highway 305, you said. Do you, yeah. do you think it has a nest every year like that? It, ha it, it has for the last decade, yes. Oh, good. There's no guarantees, but Ferrugians are pretty ferocious. Uh, I don't think bald eagles are probably the only ones that could drive them out, and bald eagles tend to like cliff faces. If anybody's interested, I could give you the exact location on the cliff face for the, where the gold, pardon me, golden eagles, where the golden eagles nest, west of 305, south of, of Harney Lake, uh, about two miles down a dirt road. I think it's Harney Lake Road, in fact. Uh, and last year, there were prairie falcon on one side of the cliff and golden eagles on the other. For those of you who get Oregon birds, you saw those great prairie falcon pictures that Albert Reichman took that was in the last issue. Um, and that's where the golden eagles nest. But they're the only ones that could drive the Ferruginous away. Other than that, you know, they're in charge. They're, you know, they're known as Budio regalis, king of the Budios, for a real reason. They're bigger, tougher, and more beautiful than any of the other Budios. So I suspect they will use that tree until it falls down. I would love to have a map that pinpoints that spot. <laughs> I'll send me an email and I'll show you right where it is. Thank you, Harry. You're welcome. Thank you. Eugenia. She's supposed to introduce these people. What happened to her? Eugenia. We've lost her. She's muted. I just asked her to unmute. Got it. Okay. Now we're going to move on to a double biller. Beth and Dick Abston became interested in birding and bird photography about 14 years ago when they bought a cabin in Camp Sherman near the Metolius River. They met a neighbor, Doug Bell, an amazing bird photographer who's well known to Salem Audubon members as, in the first place, the creator of beautiful calendars to raise money for Turtle Ridge Wildlife Center and for providing many of the bird pictures that are used in Mike Unger's birding classes. Doug Bell became Dick and Beth's mentor, and they've taken off under his instruction. Learning a new hobby at age 70 was a challenge, but capturing the photo of a bird was a thrill. Uh, they're going to, in sequence, share pictures taken through this pandemic year. While instruction, while Pandemic restrictions brought on the COVID blues. Birding helped to counteract them. Beth, I believe you start. Okay. The Dry Tortugas are 70 miles southwest of Key West and was our 48th national park on our bucket list. And we had been long in planning for February last year before any knowledge of the coronavirus hit. We added three life birds, and this is the first one, which is the magnificent frigate bird. Um, this is the male with its guller patch or gular, I guess, rarely uh, settles on water.
and the male with a juvenile also. The other bird we saw there was the brown knotty. Almost looks, that bird almost looks like it's fake. I mean, look, look at them. Like they're made out of paper or something. That's so weird. I think you have to mute your speaker, Judy. Um, and then the next bird is the sooty tern. Both of these, the knotty and the tern, are um, breed on the dry tortugas. Our next stops were on to the Everglades National Park, amazing corkscrew swamp east of Naples, and Ding Darling Wildlife Refuge on Sanibel Island. We were in bird heaven when in a puddle right next to the highway, there were seven species that didn't fly away like they always do in Oregon. Um, if you look right to the left, that's the tri-colored heron on the edge, the great blue heron, the little blue heron, the white egret, the snowy egret, two white ibis, and the double crested cormorant. To the right of this picture were um, two wood storks and there's one more. And across the highway was this huge alligator. So we were pretty excited when our trip on to the, across the Everglades. Next, the purple gallinule with its long finger like toes. The little blue heron. And then we saw this snake-like bird, its body submerged, and we've come to find out that it turned into this beautiful aninga, is how they pronounced it. We were pronouncing it wrong the whole trip. Um, we learned that it doesn't have the preen gland that most birds have to keep their feathers waterproofed. And so it has to dry. And when it's finally dry, you get this Phyllis Diller-like um, effect, which is kind of comical, but still beautiful eye. We were very lucky to see this limpkin. Um, it's uncommon to rare, and we only saw it in this one area in Corkscrew. corkscrew. And it eats apple snails, and that's why it's in that particular area, I guess. The reddish egret was just ooh, so fun to watch. It dances and runs across the water, um, chasing its prey with its wings out that kind of make a canopy that's um, to help it capture its prey. The roseate spoonbill and the double crested cormorant, which we've seen in Oregon many times. I always wondered why they called it the double crested. Well, now I know because it really does have those little um, crests of feathers. The white eyed vireo. and the red-bellied woodpecker. But the bird that made us most ex exciting, excited was this painted bunting. And after we got our several pictures, we both did a high five and almost did a dance and said, okay, we can go home now. Down in the Everglades, we saw a lot of osprey, which were huge compared to ours here. And the ranger told us that they um, take the head off to keep the fish from wiggling before they give it to their juvenile. 
who was patiently waiting. Well, not too patient. Um, black skimmer with their lower beaks longer than the top beak enables them to skim the water. But then when you see it from the side, you see how it's just really, really nice thin. Now back to the Northwest. Um, this is our birding provided wonderful reason to be outdoors, breathing fresh air, exercise, learning about nature, and especially during the pandemic. Here's a few more of the pictures that we saw, the yellow-billed magpie, and this was down in uh, Sycamore Grove, Grove, south of Red Bluff. Bluff. Male, American and Eurasian widgeon side by side and the female off to the side, but we thought this was a great comparison. A little female bush tit was at Humboldt Bay over on the coast. And back to Summer Lake, the trumpeter swans with their four cygnets. We watched and saw them several days in a row. The great horned owl and the American coot with the baby, um, which was the first time we'd ever seen a, a coot baby. And only a mother could love so cute, they're ugly, they're cute, I guess. A black Phoebe, a red necked, ring. red <laughs> ring necked pheasant, our common yellow throat. The American Dipper, or Oozle, seen in Jack Creek. And this is a leucistic towhee, which was one of our most thrilling photos of our whole year, I think, which was almost in our backyard. And the comparison of what, if someone doesn't know what the towhee looks like, the regular towhee to the left. Are there any questions? Thank you for uh, your attention. I turn over my uh, computer here to my amazing partner, 52 years, Dick, who shares my love of birding and photography. Bear with me just one second. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to be staying pretty much in our backyard. Um, again, COVID kept us at home more than we were ex ex wanting to be, but uh, gave us a great opportunity uh, to observe a lot of nesting birds right in our yard. Uh, fortunately, we got a few acres, so it, we can give them lots of room. This pair of nesting bluebirds took three weeks to locate the particular nest box that they were going to have their three uh, fledglings in. Uh, fortunately for us, it was right on a post in our garden and we kept tabs on them daily. Uh, this little house wren has got a problem as you can see uh, getting that pine needle uh, into her nest. Then July came around and uh, Beth discovered the second hummingbird nest on our property in three years. Uh, it may be the same Rufus hummingbird coming back yearly, enjoying our property and making it her, her home. Uh, when she got out to take a snack off of Beth's butterfly bush, I sneaked a peek inside the nest where one egg, um, where one egg had already hatched. If I zoom in, I think you can see the eyes and uh, the beak forming. 
You can also notice that the nest is well constructed out of lichens, moss, and held together by spider webs. Uh, about five days later, the uh, birds have fledged out and uh, the nest is starting to fill up. Uh, a few, day, few more days later, we have uh, fledglings starting to look around. Um, well, this is about the time we left for Southern Oregon to take some of the pictures at Beth, not Southern Oregon, Central Oregon that Beth uh, showed you. But before we left, there were, as you can see, we have a lot of flowers um, to water, plants very attractive to the hummingbirds, especially the currants, the foxgloves, the columbines. On coming back, uh, I could observe uh, a mama hummingbird, we called her Lucy. Here she is feeding uh, first of her two chicks uh, and then moving over and feeding the second one. Uh, she, she would leave for 30 to 40 minutes and then come back and continue uh, with her feeding. Here you can see her regurgitating, oh, this small little um, flight, flying insect, um, getting ready to feed it. Here you can see uh, the insect being consumed and the second insect coming out down the buffet line, uh, as it were. Now the nest is starting to get a little bit crowded and uh, the residents are taking a longer look around. Uh, we're gone almost three weeks now since uh, hatching and uh, this is probably the firstborn. I'm gonna say it's a him and he's really looking the world over. After this picture was taken, the next day he was gone leaving the bedroom to, I'm assuming, his sister, so that she could do a little bit of preening. preening. Uh, and now exercising her wings. And after this shot was taken, she was gone. Uh, none of them came back, back to their nest. Uh, they were, uh, they're in the yard visiting best flowers. Meanwhile, on the other side of the uh, yard, in the barn, we had Hester the nester, the broody hen. Um, so we tried an experiment. Um, we took her out of the coop, put her in the corral, uh, went and got four Wyandotte chicks at Wilco and uh, let them into the corral and Miraculously, within 20 minutes, uh, the four birds dove underneath, found their way underneath Hester, and there they there they grew uh, to maturity. Right now, they're giving us uh, plenty of eggs. Okay, on the other side of the house, uh, this Western screech owl had uh, discovered a nest box I had put up over a year ago. Put it up. Um, that side of the house because I had discovered a cavity of a western screech owl um, that was nesting the year before. Don't know if it's the same one or, uh, or, a, or a daughter or son, but uh, this, this, guy is, this guy is hooting every night. All right, now leaving our backyard, we head back to uh, Central Oregon and uh, we're watching more nesting. Red nape, sack sup, sap, sap sucker, um, leaving the nest. Here you can see the female on top, the, the sap sucker. They're changing the guard, as are these Williamson sap suckers. Uh, we have hundreds of pictures of these guys doing this in and out, in and out uh, for hours. Uh, 
surprisingly enough, the male was the only one to evacuate the poop sacks from out of the nest. The female never did. Um, returning back to Salem, uh, Tim alerted us to a stilt sandpiper there, Fairview wetlands. So we scurried over there and got a picture of a very rare occurrence here in Salem. As later in October, uh, we learned about the wood sandpiper that uh, that came all the way, to, well, I don't know where it came, but he should be in the Arctic or in Siberia in October and said he came here in Salem. We went looking for him several times. Harry Fuller helped us, but it was about two or three trips later, uh, Beth managed to get a really good shot of uh, the wood sandpiper. Then December came along, and that's a month we usually put our cameras away, and uh, because it's rainy, it's windy, but Tim told us that there was this American tree swirl north of Basket Slough, and sure enough, right where he told us, uh, we located the bird and uh, got an awfully nice shot of that. Uh, then we went over to Newport, and uh, again, got really lucky with the sunlight and the wind and got some excellent photographs of the snow bunting that comes down uh, also from the Arctic. And this small flock uh, visited, visits Newport annually. Uh, last year we tried three times and just never got a decent shot, but this year we lucked out. Um, then we heard that over by the Hatfield Marine Center, there were some wimbrels, and we had never got a good shot of a wimbrel close up, but here we do. Uh, we found these two wimbrels uh, over there also in December. Then uh, while we were there, people told us that up on top of Mary's Peak, uh, if we were lucky, we might catch this small flock of gray crown rosy finches, and sure enough, after maneuvering snow and ice on the road and on the trail, we got up there and they accommodated us by some uh, close shots. Uh, lovely, lovely looking birds. Also uh, pretty rare for uh, this far south from the Arctic. Uh, also in December, it was pretty strange to see a burrowing owl still uh, hanging out. I guess he missed the flight to Florida. And our, my last picture here is a winter wren uh, taken over just before Christmas or by the Metolius. This guy uh, stayed around for, oh, half a second and, and uh, let us take the picture. So uh, that's the end of my session. Anybody um, have any questions? Judy, unmute. Judy, <laughs> unmute. Good. Unmute. I didn't get any questions from the audience, but um, I sure enjoyed all of your pictures. That was great. Thank you. Very good. Very good show. <laughs> it was fascinating to see the feeding by the hummingbirds. I've never Thank observed yeah. that. Yeah, that was taken just outside my office window. I, I got Second pretty story. lucky once wow. Beth located the nest. I, I never saw it, but she did. And nice looks at a Rufus hummingbird. Yeah. All your photos are just beautiful. Thank you. Thanks. So what, what kind of camera do you have? We both uh, shoot a Canon 7D Mark II. Okay. Um, all crisp focus and nice exposure. Yeah, you don't haven't seen all the thousands that we didn't show. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that does it for tonight. I want to thank all of you who put so much time and energy into pulling together a proper program. 
all of you had great narratives and great pictures and it was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thanks Happy uh, birthday, for, birthday. for pulling it together. Okay. Thank you.